who you have to call during Ghostbusters? They're like, I'm getting the mayor on the phone. That's right. <laughs> Has anyone called you yet with ghosts and need attending? <laughs> no, 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 not yet. <laughs> Good. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today's pod is a candid conversation with the newly elected mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bass. We had Mayor Bass on before her election, and I did a series of rants telling you to vote for her because A, I truly believe she was the best person for the job, B, I hated that someone who wasn't who he said he was was running against her, and C, because what happens in big cities is a beta test for what can be successful, not just across the state, but across the entire country. Successful policies and legislation are infectious. Look at what's happening in the red states. One state does a trans ban, 10 more states join in. One state bans abortion, the rest fall in line. One state writes a don't say gay bill or bans a bunch of books, and suddenly it's an epidemic. But this can work for good policies too. And cities like LA can be kind of a test kitchen for what can work nationwide. So I'm having Karen on today for her 100th day in office to show what good leadership looks like and what we should all be looking for from our mayors across the country. If you're paying attention right now, you know the country and its values and democracy itself are under attack. So those of us who want to defeat this rising tide of hateful fascist authoritarian behavior need to be strategic with long-term, big-picture plans to actually make people's lives better, to show people that government in the right hands can really do good. What happens in Los Angeles is what could happen across America. What we learn here, we can recreate in other cities and states. Not to hurt people or strip away their rights like the Republicans are doing with their anti-gay, anti-trans, anti-black, anti-woke legislative agenda, but with positive things like solving homelessness, dealing with water crises, being business positive, or figuring out affordable housing. We are told all the time that government is the enemy, but that's mostly by people who want you focused on an enemy rather than paying attention to government. So today, I want you paying attention to government. I want you to hear from a leader who is out here doing it differently, and if she is successful, will help people solve problems far beyond her own city. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, former state assembly member and California congresswoman, lifelong community organizer, and first woman elected as mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bass. Welcome back, Karen. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Well, thank you for joining me. I mean, since our last conversation, you went from mayoral candidate to mayor. So let me first say, congratulations, Madam Mayor. I could not be more pleased to have you in charge. Well, thank you so much. And I want you to know that that transition was three weeks. So I had three weeks to go from being a member of Congress to running the nation's second largest city. Ah, <laughs> oh, I bet you didn't spend it all in Cabo either. <laughs> you were just no, I did not. hit the ground running. <laughs> now, listen, I know your agenda is focused on setting LA in a new direction and you've been at it for a hundred days. So how's it going? It's going great. I want you to know that I'm loving every minute of it, you know, because nothing fulfills me more than to go to an encampment and to see people in tents and to get them out of there and get them housed and then go to visit them afterwards and to see how things are developing. And so I am, I said, I'm like a kid in a candy shop. Oh my gosh. I'm telling you, for, for people who don't live in LA, arguably the biggest issue that we're dealing with is our homelessness issue or the amount of unhoused people in this city. And Karen and her opponent both promised to tackle this issue, but Karen was the one looking to solve the problem at its root. So instead of just making it look better for people who are driving by it, her goal was to deal with the underlying causes so we didn't end up here again. So now that being said, the initial crisis still had to be dealt with. So on her very first day of work, instead of going straight to City Hall, it is my my understanding that you went to the emergency center to declare a state of emergency. Now, what did the emergency declaration of homelessness allow you to do? Well, first of all, I had to bring in all of the general managers from all of the various departments in the city to put the city on notice that all hands on deck, 47,000 people sleeping on our streets all around the city in tents, and we needed to do everything we could. So it allowed me to direct the city, the city council, and to essentially order everybody to have all hands on deck. And you know what was great about it is that it sent a message 
that reverberated throughout the region. So a week later, the county declared a state of emergency. Santa Monica did. Long Beach, the surrounding cities that are all part of the same county, declared a state of emergency. And that's allowed us to fast track things. Because one of the big problems in L.A. is that it's so hard to build anything because of all of the bureaucratic red tape. And then I've been discovering more red tape. So reasons why people haven't been housed because of crazy requirements that I found that we put on ourselves. So since we did it, we can undo it. And I'm in the process of undoing some of the bureaucratic red tape that has left people on the street for years. Yeah. I mean, I think you've been really clear that it's these bureaucratic delays, these unnecessary reviews, the endless paperwork, and as you said, the red tape that actually stop us from acting with the urgency that crises need. And I think it doesn't matter what city in America you're in, that's often the case. You know, you have leaders in place that want to make a difference, and yet they can't because of stipulations they put on themselves over the years. Absolutely. But that's good news and bad news. It's bad news that has happened for so long. It's good news because it shows that it's fixable, it's solvable. And one of the things that's been the most exciting over these last hundred days is that we have affirmatively dispelled the myth. Because a lot of people believe that those folks in those tents are there because they want to be there. They're there because they're all drug addicts. And it's been a denial of the fact that there's literally thousands of children in those tents with moms who were fleeing domestic violence or people who just couldn't afford to live in this city because this city has become so expensive. You know, if you get behind in your rent and you get evicted or you have bad credit, you might not ever be able to rent again. And so that's why we have to address some of these problems. We're getting people in motels. We're addressing why they were unhoused and then moving them on to permanent supportive housing. I think that's so essential. You move people out of tents to alleviate their immediate suffering. But part of it is also proving this idea that people just chose to be homeless in the first place. This argument that people want to be unhoused and that's how they want to be, I think is something that people often tell themselves to feel better. But people really do want help and better opportunities. I mean, you were quoted saying, I want to make sure that the city of Los Angeles holds nothing back when it comes to bringing people inside and providing them the support they need to stay inside for good, to save lives, to restore our neighborhoods, and to house Angelinos immediately, we must urgently prioritize underutilized existing city-owned properties. And you were just mentioning motels, right? So with that in mind, I know you asked to be provided with an inventory of unused, underutilized city properties, which could be transformed into temporary or permanent housing or places we could we could put people. And then each site is kind of assessed individually at what kind of housing could be built or used on that location. So this is a brand new program. How are you feeling about it? How's it working? Oh, I'm feeling really good. We have all sorts of problems because when you're building the plane and flying it too, you're learning and you're discovering different things. So we did identify the city on land, but we still have to build on it. That's why we're using motels now, because I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to say you stay in that tent for the next five months until we can get something built. No, let's get off the street today. Let's be in a motel for the next few months while we're getting something up and running. And we're using all different types, modular housing, containers, different things so that we can get the building done quickly. Right, right. I think you said it beautifully when you said, we want people inside, sleeping in a bed, waking up to services and stability, which will help them get back on their feet. All of this is part of what's called Inside Safe. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Inside Safe is one program that we're doing to get people off the streets immediately. We have outreach workers that go out to the encampments. Many of the outreach workers were unhoused at one point in their lives as well. Mm. They talk to the people in the tents and it might be three or four days that they have conversations to build up trust because a lot of these people have been lied to, disappointed so many times that they wanna make sure that what you're offering them is legitimate. And so the third or fourth day, we call it move-in day. And that's the day that they leave their tent and they go to a motel. And again, I've been there through every part of the process in different locations. And we've been operating now in about 13 different locations around the city. We hope to get to capacity where we can actually operate in 13 different parts of the city 
all at the same time. So we move them into motels and we look for motels that are nearby where they were camping because they've built up community. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. Folks are in the tents. It's actually little communities yeah. and, and they have relationships outside of those tents. So there might be, say, 10 people in tents and maybe three of them say, no, I don't want to go. I want to stay on the street. But when move in day comes and the bus comes and the majority of the people get on, the, guess what? Those three people that said they didn't want to move, they go. And now we're having an opposite problem. We go and those 10 people on move in day turn into 15. Why? Because they called other people in tents and said, hey, this is real. So we have a lot of problems, but I think those are good problems. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the before and after pictures from South LA, from Hollywood, from Venice. I have a number of friends that live in Venice and we I went out to dinner the other day and they were like, thank God for Karen Bass. Cause like you, the streets <laughs> are completely different. Like it is amazing. And like you said, you have 13 operations in LA right now. I think so far yeah. you've had zero arrests. Is that true? Absolutely no arrests because the police are not involved. Well, but that's the thing is that you just can't go. You have to treat people with respect. And one thing that we've done is that we've not involved the press. We've not involved it because this is not a publicity stunt. And we right. want to pre preserve people's dignity. You imagine somebody living on the street. You want to pre preserve their privacy and their dignity. And when I go out, you know, I go out as low key as possible uh, because I want to talk to them. But I go out to show I'm serious. That's why I'm here. This is not a stunt. And we're going to stick with you until you're okay. This is not about dumping you in a motel and then having a press conference and saying we did something. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's kind of the most important thing to see people as people and realize that so many of us are actually so close to that ourselves. Like, you know, we can't just look at homelessness as an us versus them thing because so many people are just one bad accident, one divorce, one job loss away from being unhoused. And I think people need to remember that it all comes down to us working together, that I think you've even said it, it's not just a city problem, it's a moral problem. Absolutely. I mean, just think about it for a minute. And it, what has happened, I think, to us is that we've kind of adjusted and acclimated to the point where we don't really see the people anymore. Yeah. We might see the tents and they're ugly and we don't like them, but we don't think about who's inside those tents. And I do believe that in order for us to solve this problem, we have to have all hands on deck, which means all Angelinos can play a role because we're all impacted by it. The housed are impacted just like the unhoused. Yeah, I know that you've said that you want to align every level of government to solve this problem because yes. it's like creating the spirit that this is the effort of the entire city so that everyone gets involved. It isn't just about pushing these people off to the side. It's about solving a problem that deals with the whole city. And I know that even nationally, President Biden has made a pledge to reduce homelessness by 25%. I know that Governor Gavin Newsom here in California just announced that LA will be the latest group to receive a pro-housing designation that will build housing faster in this state. And I know that they also just awarded us almost $200 million for sort of multifamily developments in LA and LA County. That must feel kind of thrilling to have all, all those parts working together. Well, you know what? I have to tell you that I did want to have all levels of government in alignment, but I had no idea what happened this quickly. It literally happened in the first few weeks. I mean, and so when the White House said they wanted to reduce homelessness, I was on the phone immediately and said, you know what? Just come to L.A. You can achieve your national goal if you come to L.A. Four days later, Ambassador Susan Rice, the head of the Domestic Policy Council, was here. And so we're right now negotiating a memorandum of understanding with the Biden administration. In addition to what you said about the governor, he also just awarded us 500 uh, tiny homes. I'm not the biggest fan, but heck, it's a lot better than, than a tent on the street. And then the county and the city, we have been finally hand in glove. Uh, Janice Hahn, who's the chairwoman of the Board of Supervisors this year, we've been working lockstep with each other every step of the way. And one of the fundamental problems that had been happening before is that no level of government was in alignment with the other. In fact, everybody was pointing fingers at each other. No longer the case.
That's great. And that's what we should all hope for in all of the cities in America, to have our governments working in alignment instead of against each other to solve one issue at a time. Maybe we need more uh, emergency declarations to get us all on the same page. (laughs) Exactly. So listen, we get people off the streets, we get them into some sort of housing, be it a tiny home, be it a motel, whatever it is for now. Then what comes next? What's the next plan there? Well, first of all, we have to understand why they were unhoused, what led to them losing their housing, and discovering that leads to then what you need to do to make sure that that person does not lose their housing again. Was it bad credit? Were they formerly incarcerated? Are they a teenager that aged out of foster care and that the government essentially put them out on the street? Are you a veteran? Are you suffering from some chronic illness? Is it mental health? Is it substance abuse? I met a woman who was in temporary housing who lost her housing because she had cancer. So she kept missing her job. You know, eventually they uh, fired her and she found out later that she was diagnosed with cancer. She knew something was wrong, but, you know, she wound up living in a car. She lost the car and then she was on the street. You know, now she's taken care of. So there is the stereotype that everybody on the street, number one in Los Angeles is from some other city. That's a stereotype. That's not true. Or two, they're drug addicts and they want to be high. They don't want to get sober or they're mentally ill. All of the above is true, but not in the numbers and percentages that people describe. It does not characterize the unhoused population. Do you know we have people in those tents who literally work full time? They Uh. work full time, but they can't get it together to rent someplace because LA is so darn expensive. Or like I said, they might've had bad credit or been evicted before and no one's going to rent to them. Well, let's talk about how expensive LA is because this also isn't an LA problem, but it's certainly a very distinct LA problem. You know, um, your focus is to make additional investments to deal with the homelessness crisis, to make Los Angeles safer and more affordable for all. And obviously that's wonderful at all levels. The government seem to be working together to solve that problem. But this city is mental. I mean, to try and rent a place here is crazy. And do you think it has anything to do with major companies and hedge funds coming in here and gobbling up real estate, entire buildings, single family dwellings, and then inflating the price of entire neighborhoods or renting houses back to us? that are way overpriced or that we should be able to buy, single families should be able to buy. Because I think about this all the time, especially, you know, this is something my family deals with. You know, I think this behavior feeds the homelessness crisis. You know, people that should be moving out of one bedrooms into two bedrooms or two bedrooms into starter houses. They're not moving because they can't afford the next jump. You know, they just can't do it. They can't make that next move. So they stay. So it sort of bottlenecks back to the people that should be getting the one bedroom or the studio apartment, they can't get it because it's not affordable. No one's moving because they can't afford the next place. What do you think about that? Because it is a problem. Well, you're absolutely right. And I'll go back to what you said, the origins of the problem. Let me just date it for you. The the last great recession from 08 to about 2011, so many people lost their housing. And that's when the big corporations came in and gobbled up a lot of the housing. And so that is absolutely a problem. And what we need to do is is that we have to build so much more, which is why we were trying to identify the public land, because that then you don't even have to invest in the land. And by the way, the alignment of government helps with that as well, because every level of government has land. Los Angeles Unified School District is a huge landowner. And so what we want to do is build housing that, guess what? Teachers and students can afford to live in. LA Unified has lost over 200,000 students in the last 10 years because people have moved out of Los Angeles. And so we have to figure out a way to bring down the cost of housing and increasing the supply is absolutely one method to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Because you also see people who can't afford to live near their work, which only adds to the commuter problem, right? right? They have to live so much further away and then drive into their job. And that also just causes a problem in the city, not just our city, many cities deal with this. And I think people invest in real estate with the idea that at some point they will sell it and they will make a profit. But if the prices keep going up the way they are, who is going to be buying this real estate? Like if boomers are sitting here at their $2 million house, but millennials and people who will be buying houses aren't able to afford that, then what happens there? We either need to add more houses or we need to bring the prices down to make it realistic. 
And realistically, we need to do both. Mm -hmm. We need to bring the prices down and we need to build. And you are absolutely right. And the other thing that has happened is generational. And so as people have gotten older and a lot of families, the adult children cannot afford to maintain the homes and they lose them. Or people who are elderly realize there's so much money that they can make from selling their house, they leave. And then that adds to gentrification as well. And so what you're having in Los Angeles, especially in South LA, is a a real continuing displacement of African-American residents. Yeah. And this is how people end up on the street when they had no intention to and might have been property owners in the past. Exactly. I've talked to people that won't move out of their houses because they can't afford to downsize. They're like, I've actually paid this house off. I don't need this much room anymore. But to go to this place, it would cost me more money. So I'm just going to stay here. And then nothing moves along. Right. And, you know, uh, back to that stereotype of the unhoused being from other cities uh, in South L.A., and I would imagine this is the case in other cities as well, a large number of people who are unhoused literally lived on the same block inside or in the nearby neighborhood. I went to an, an encampment in South L.A., and I was asking people, where where are you from? And they go, well, I'm from right over there and point to a couple of blocks away. But they were all from the neighborhood. We need to do something about this. I mean, I personally don't think big companies should be able to buy multiple single family dwellings. I don't think that foreign buyers should be able to come in and swoop in and take entire neighborhoods. I mean, I know that where I'm from in Canada, if you are a foreign buyer, your your tax rate is so much higher to buy single family dwellings to dissuade people from buying investment properties rather than letting locals buy homes where they actually live. And I think this is a problem that needs to be solved nationwide. It really is a problem that leads to homelessness right across the nation, not just in Los Angeles. Exactly. Okay, we're just going to take a moment to thank the sponsor who made this conversation possible. And we'll be right back after this with Mayor Karen Bass. I understand it's a bit jarring to interrupt these conversations to talk about products, but I need to be really clear that without the goodwill of our sponsors, it would be impossible to keep this kind of work going. I'm deeply grateful to companies who choose to sponsor shows like mine. Independent work like this requires people who believe in it, and it makes it infinitely easier when the feeling is entirely mutual. You've heard me talk about Lomi before. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps into dirt in under four hours. I understand our planet is facing a major crisis, so taking steps to limit my family's personal carbon footprint right now feels essential. We all make a ton of food waste. You don't realize it until you start to collect it when you use a product like the Lomi. My dog rejects his food. Recipes are made for four and my family has three. My teenager is starving and then he won't eat. And without the Lomi, all that extra food just goes in the garbage, ending up in landfills, releasing methane into the air. But with the Lomi, I don't have to feel as guilty because I know I'm doing something productive. With the Lomi, the leftovers that don't quite get eaten, the vegetables that die in your crisper, the fruit that fuzzed, it's now composted down into nutrient-rich dirt you can feed to your plants or just throw in the garbage. No word of a lie, with the Lomi, our family has gone from three to four bags of garbage a week to one. I can't tell you how much I love this machine. And I keep saying it because it's true. You need to get one. Not because they sponsor my show, I am so grateful that they sponsor my show, but because it is an amazing product. And Pila, the company that makes it, walks the walk. If you wanna join my family and start making a positive environmental impact in your own kitchen, then Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash politicsgirl and use the promo code politicsgirl to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to lomi.com slash politicsgirl and use the promo code politicsgirl at checkout. Everybody should have one of these machines. I know you won't be disappointed. Well, listen, I'll switch gears here because ultimately this isn't just about the unhoused or about housing in general. I was reading your budget letter on your mayoral website because you know I'm a nerd and I'm always checking out your website. But I have to tell everyone listening to this that much like Karen's candidate website, her website for mayor is exactly how government websites should look and function. And do you mind if I just take a moment to talk about how your site functions? No, that would be great. 
I feel like if we want our governments to be accessible, to actually help us, to be public servants, we should be insisting that our local, state, federal offices function this clearly. So I'm just going to take a second because I want people to understand, when you go to mayor.lacity.gov, there's a short message from Karen and a nice picture. She's looking great. And then there's a box to request city services. And then there's a box for the LA City directory, one for COVID-19, and then an employment box if you want to join the administration as either a paid or volunteer position. But it's the city services and city directory that really got me because I live here and I had no idea that this site existed. The Bass administration has made it easy for people to connect with their government. And they've done it in this way that's really appealing because it's not just the phone numbers of the people. It's the city directories. Everyone is there. Elected officials, board commissioners, departments, bureaus of public works, building safety, city attorney, the zoo. I mean, they're all there. And it's not just their phone numbers. It's color-coded email, phone, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If they have a YouTube channel, it's there too. So you have made it accessible for LA people to connect with their government. And I think most people should look at that and say, this is what I would want from my own government. And this is what it looks like when government's working properly. That's exactly right. And thank you so much for pointing that out. And since you pointed it out, let me make a plug. Do it. Say you might be interested in working for the city. The city has thousands of vacancies, or you might be interested in working for the mayor's office. And we certainly have plenty of vacancies, or you might be interested in a voluntary position as a commissioner and know that all of that is available and you can access it through the website. Thank you so much for that. No, I love it. While I was there, I signed up for Notify LA where you get text messages for what's going on (laughs) in your particular area. You know, if there's going to be a flood or if a road's closed, they will send a text to your phone, which I think is marvelous. So in case people think that you're just focusing on the unhoused, that's not true. I want to touch on just another thing you're working on right now so people know you're out here actively diversifying. You just announced a deputy mayor for business and economic development. So you've made it quite clear that the success of our business community is key to the success of our city. So do you want to talk to me a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, I am very excited to talk about Rachel Freeman. She is our deputy mayor for business and economic development. And you know that when we talk about the unhoused population, the fundamental problem is profound income inequality and disparity in Los Angeles. Well, how do you address that? You need good paying jobs. How do you address that? We need to have a thriving business sector because who hires people? You either work for the public sector, the private sector, or you are uh, self-employed. And so we have to make sure that every sector is very vibrant. Just as we were saying how difficult it is to build in Los Angeles, business owners will tell you it's also very difficult to do business here, which is why businesses leave Los Angeles. So we have to make sure that we have a vibrant business community so that we can have more jobs. And then we're getting ready to host major international events. I mean, the World Cup is coming here in just two years. The um, Olympics is coming here in four years. And so we want to be prepared for all of that. And that is an opportunity for people to get into business as well as to grow your business. And so we're going to focus on that. So stay tuned because we're going to be doing a lot of convenings. You know, the city of Los Angeles does billions of dollars of business with small businesses and large businesses. A lot of them aren't even from California. I happen to think businesses from Los Angeles need to have priority. It's the procurement process. And we want to make sure that that is easy and accessible and in a proactive way, go out to small businesses to make sure that they have access. Yeah. And also these jobs that you're saying are available, jobs in Los Angeles County are available to people. And those are also probably jobs that people who you are currently unhoused, then become housed, can then go and and get. Thank you so much for mentioning that because we did just get on the conveyor belt, we did just get to permanent supportive housing. But the next step is to leave permanent supportive housing and to go back into the mainstream. Now, I will say that there's a percentage of Angelinos that will never be able to leave permanent supportive housing because they have profound illnesses. But it's a very, very, very small number. When we put somebody in permanent supportive housing, it's for two years. So in that two years, they can address what their problems are, and then they can work for the city. Thousands of jobs, those are union paying jobs, union jobs, 
Those are good paying jobs with benefits and pensions. Who has pensions these days? No one. We don't get gold watches right. and we don't get pensions right. anymore. Exactly. We can't be company men. Right. It's ridiculous. <laughs> No, listen, you can't do anything without money and money comes from taxes and taxes come from successful businesses and people being successful in the city. You know, I looked at your city department budget requests from everyone from animal services to the city attorney and I saw what they were asking for. And just so people know, each one of these budgets that are put in from the different departments around the city are typically between 90 and 500 pages long. Some of them are 800 pages long. Parks and Rec is 1,700 <laughs> pages long. So people want a lot and they want the mayor to do a lot and they want the city to do a lot. So we have to work on a way to make these budgets stretch, to fill these jobs, to fill the positions. And to do that, we need a successful, thriving business community to keep that up. Exactly. Exactly. Exactly right. That's right. <laughs> well, listen, before you go, I want to highlight the type of leader you are as a source of inspiration for those of us who might yeah. be looking to run or looking to support people who are going to run. And so if I could just go back to your budget, because I think, you know, show me your budget, I'll show you my priorities. You know, that is sort of the way it is. And part of the letter right. you wrote to the various departments said you were interested in being creative and that you welcomed ideas in any departments might have for revenue generation or cost recovery. It basically read like, come to me with your ideas. We need to be realistic. I can't give you everything you want, but let's work together and think outside the box to get the most done for the city, which was very different from the kind of top down, I alone can fix it mentality that Um, we get from a lot of these leaders. And I just wanted to say, I appreciate that a lot, that you were like, come to me with ideas and let's see what we can do. I very much believe in a collaborative approach. Um, I believe that in every aspect of my life. Now that goes back to the community organizer roots because that is how organizers function. And I'll tell you that one of the things I've loved about being in public office is applying some of those same grassroots strategies to leading and, uh, and telling people that you want them to come forward with their ideas. We want them to come forward and tell me what your problems are so that we can address it together. Don't hide your problems to say, oh, I don't want you to know that I have this deficiency here. Tell me the deficiency so we can work together. You're not going to be punished for saying that we have a weakness. And so I tried to set that tone on the very first day when I declared a state of emergency and I had all of the general managers come forward. I, d- I delivered that message and said, you know what? It's it, it's a new day. Let's start out, you know, on a new in a new direction. Yeah. And in the tone of collaboration, which you obviously love, you often use the quote from Diane Watson, the lift while you climb. Can you <laughs> yes. tell me, can you tell That's... me, can you tell our audience a little bit about lift while you climb before you go? Yes. Well, uh, Congresswoman Diane Watson uh, has been very um, instrumental in my life because she decided that I needed to go to Sacramento and then she decided I needed to go to Washington. And basically her model was, Uh, lift as you climb, which means I'm getting ready to retire from Congress. And so I want to help somebody take my seat. And uh, when I left the assembly, I did that. And when I left uh, Congress, I did that as well, modeling, modeling her. Because to me, if you really do believe in fighting for justice, if you really do believe in fighting for social and economic justice, then you know that that's a fight that goes on forever. And so it is in your interest to make sure that there are people ready to come behind you so that when you step aside, there's somebody else to fill your shoes immediately and there's no gap. Yeah. And it's ultimately just shifting the mentality from an individual to a group, which is what we need to do with the city, which is what we need to do with homelessness, which is what we need to do even with democracy, to shift it as a group. How will this serve America? How will this serve Los Angeles? How will this serve the position I'm in now? But who will come up after me to fill it? I think that's a wonderful way of looking at it. And I think... That's why you're a different kind of leader and one we should try to be find more (laughs) of around the city. So I wish you the best of luck. I want to thank you for joining me today, Madam Mayor. You're out here proving that government can be moving fast and effective when it has its priorities straight. And right now you've made homelessness, which is truly a national issue, your priority. And we're going to be watching your successes and what you're able to accomplish here in Los Angeles, because it is clearly a beta test for what is possible around the country. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And I look forward to us continuing this conversation. So do I. I just look forward to seeing what happens next. I'm so proud of what's happening in Los Angeles. And I'm proud of my vote for you. (laughs) 
Appreciate you. So that was Mayor Karen Bass reminding us that one of the best ways to solve problems is with an all hands on deck collaborative approach. That when you see an issue that requires immediate attention, like LA with homelessness, you pull out all the stops, you streamline the bureaucratic Michigas, and you take the time to connect with the people who need you the most. Karen isn't doing this for the press or the props. She's doing this for the people of the city, and it's working. As of today, LA has already brought more than a thousand Angelinos off the streets and placed them in housing. And she has done it with respect for the people who need the housing and the long-term plan of doing it correctly so they never need housing again. The city is finding homes for people who need them and jobs for people who want them. At the end of the day, the crisis of the unhoused is bigger than Los Angeles. It's about having enough housing for our citizens to live. It's about housing being affordable enough for us to choose to live in it. And it's about being able to afford to move up so someone else can move in. Finally, it's about accommodating businesses so they can be successful and hire people who can also be successful. It is all connected, just like we're all connected. And while, as Mayor Bass says, it's hard to build the plane and fly it at the same time, it isn't impossible. And we should be looking to elect more leaders who want to solve our problems rather than use our problems to get elected. I want to thank Mayor Bass for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.